Okay, let's go ahead and get started. So, you guys made it to the last session of the week. Congratulations, you are in the seats. So this is Zero Trust Network Access Demystified. My name is Steven Chimes. I am a security architect focused on large enterprises. For the last 10 years, um, I've been focused on all of security for large financials, manufacturing, pharmaceuticals outside of the US um, in the New York, New Jersey type area. So typically really large organizations. For the last two years, I've been spending time developing and building out some of our next generation zero trust network access solutions, which is going to be the focus of this particular talk. So what are we going to cover today? We are going to cover why ZTNA matters, some of its evolution, and then we're going to dive into two new technologies that have come out from Cisco in the last six months to a year, Z Zero Trust Access on Secure Firewall and Zero Trust Access within Cisco Secure Access. What we will not be covering today, we won't be covering ICE, Security Group Tags, TrustSec, or Duo. So if you're in this session for any of those things, you probably want to find another session for the last session of the week. So with that, on questions, this room is large. If you're in the first couple of rows, in time permitting, I'll try to take interactive questions. If you're in the back set, post the question on WebEx. Regardless, if you're in the back row, you can post the question on WebEx. I will answer every question I legally can after the session or, or over the next couple of days. So why ZTNA in the first place? So over the last three years since the pandemic, we saw a lot of shifts in terms of how users access applications. Roll back three or four years ago, most applications were hosted inside a single or a couple data centers. We used VPN to access those applications. Those users were either in the office, most of the time, very rarely remote. Pandemic drastically shifted that. We now have lots of remote users. Remote work is a lot more common. And so we have a spread set of employees, contractors. Sometimes they're in the office. Sometimes they are remote. Applications also significantly changed. It used to be we had all of our applications in a couple of data centers. Now we have applications in data centers, we have them in co-location facilities, we have them in infrastructure as a service providers, a lot of organizations have them in multiple infrastructure as a service providers, AWS, GCP, Azure. So we now have a much more distributed application set. We also have a lot more SaaS applications. So we have users that can access applications when they're not connected to VPN. So there's a lot more employee confusion I have access to some applications, some of my applications aren't working, where in the past, if your applications didn't work, they all didn't work, and it was because you weren't connected to VPN. All of that change has caused users to be confused, we have a lot more complexity, and the reality is, is a lot of theoretical attacks that you know, us as security practitioners would, were warning organizations about actually became reality. It became a lot more profitable to go after cybercrime. Cyber crime. And so we had an uptick in the execution of cybercrime. It's no longer just to cause damage. There's a lot more financial incentive behind it. And so we have a lot more chaos that we're dealing with. And so organizations have really started to say, hey, you know that zero trust thing that was always a next year problem? I actually want to tackle it this year. Um, I think over my entire career, segmentation, zero trust, you know, though it wasn't called it at the time, was always, yeah, we're gonna do that in a year or two, we're kind of planning it. The next year comes along, yeah, we're gonna do it in a year or two. Organizations are actually implementing it now because the need is there. So what is zero trust network access? Well, if you take the name, zero trust network access, the concept of zero trust principle applied to network access. And if you just looked at the name, you'd say, okay, that makes sense. The reality is, is most of the conversations I have around zero trust network access don't start with zero trust. Usually, when I, we, we, when I get brought into a conversation and we're talking about ZTNA in some way, shape, or form, usually the first words out of a customer's mouth is, I want 
a better user experience. I want VPN-less. I want to get rid of VPN. I want client-less, typically referring to getting rid of VPN. What they're really saying is, I want a better user experience for my users. I don't want them to have to worry about connecting to the application, can bringing up VPN, authenticating. I want to deliver a transparent user experience to them. That is probably nine out of 10 conversations have something to do, whoops, something to do around user experience when it comes to zero trust network access. The second is almost always SaaS delivery. So we have all of these applications that have moved to SaaS. I've moved applications to infrastructure as a service providers. Let me get the VPN out of my data center into something that's a little bit more scalable. The pandemic caught it, taught us that unless you plan for your entire, entire employee base to be remote, a lot of organizations had trouble scaling to all of a sudden, every one of my employees are now working remotely. A lot of VPN deployments were not scaled to that. SaaS, from a scale perspective, helps eliminate that worry and having to scale out for that, that level of service, even if you're not using it every single day. The other thing about SaaS delivery, we have all of those applications spread all over the place. Getting connectivity and optimizing that from your users, you know, it's no longer you connect to the data center from a VPN perspective that your applications are in. Typically, if you're doing a VPN, you're connecting to a data center, and then you're also hopping to a co-location facility or an infrastructure as a service provider. So SaaS also allows us to optimize that access path. And then the third most common reason why zero trust network access comes up is zero trust. The reality is that a lot of organizations, when they implement a zero trust network access solution, often will implement it for user experience, SaaS delivery, and then ZTNA is something that's going to be deployed over time. It is not typically the thing that is deployed right out of the gate. User experience and SaaS delivery are, the, are very often the primary drivers, although zero trust is absolutely critical from a security practitioner perspective. So how does zero trust, zero trust access, zero trust network access, and zero trust application access interrelate? So this is a mental model that I have adopted. It has helped me explain zero trust, zero trust network access to my colleagues, customers, and it has resonated well. If you have a different view of what ZTNA is, zero trust access, zero trust application access, that is perfectly fine. Just sharing this as an example of one way to think about it, there are a million different definitions, especially when it comes to, for example, zero trust network access. So zero trust, comprehensive security framework, concept of release privilege, continuous trust monitoring, trust but verify, and the whole goal here is to reduce risk for the organization. Zero trust access in comparison, as the name implies, is the application of zero trust principles to any type of access. Zero trust network access, at least in terms of the way that I think about it from an outcome perspective, is the application of the zero trust principles to network access in some way, shape, or form. And then this name implies zero trust application access is the application of zero trust principles applied specifically to application access. The question that typically comes up now is, okay, what is the real difference between ZTNA and zero trust application access? So the way that I look at it is it's primarily policy driven. Um, I've heard various different definitions that zero trust application access is proxied, zero trust network access is not proxied. Honestly, from an outcome perspective, I never really liked that definition. So the definition I prefer to use myself is that what does your policy look like? What are you giving the users access to? So zero trust network access, I'm giving access to a broad range of the network or you know, a, a, a portion of it. So in this example, I'm giving them access to an entire, entire FQDN space or an entire large subnet. That's pretty clearly network access. And then applying zero trust principles to that. You know, who is the user? They're authenticated with MFA. They have a particular device posture. They have a particular location. Um, I'm applying continuous monitoring in terms of IPS inspection, TLS decrypt. On the other side of that, you have zero trust application access. 
that's where you're being a lot more fine-grained in terms of the access you're providing. I'm giving you access to the JIRA application, or I'm giving you access to the Active Directory domain controllers. That is pretty clearly an application. Same thing, you're applying zero trust principles to that, who the person is, how they've, how they've authenticated, their device posture, continuous monitoring, et cetera. Now the question becomes, well, what's, you know, if I give a user access to port 22 across the entire network, is that an application? It's SSH. Is it network because I've given them access to you know, a giant portion of the network? And the reality is, is it's probably, you know, pick whichever one you want to call it. But in general, I like to say that trying to differentiate between ZTNA and zero trust application access is somewhat kind of organization specific. And at the end of the day, it really comes down to what does your policy look like? There are lots of organizations that I've talked to that want to implement zero trust access solutions. They want the user experience, they want the cloud delivery, but they want fairly broad application access controls. They don't want yet to get down to defining each individual application. There are other, the other organizations that want to be very fine-grained in their policy. They want to deliver something more like a zero trust application access type level of control. That's perfectly valid as well. Now, because of these two different definitions, from a branding perspective, Cisco has decided to go with zero trust access as the name for all of our solutions that kind of fall on there, under this umbrella. We don't use the term zero trust network access. We don't use the term zero trust application access. We use zero trust access as a whole. And then you can kind of pick what your implementation is. There was a question. Yeah, so the question is, in practice, what is the split I see between ZTNA and zero trust application access? Gartner actually did a recent paper on this, and this kind of corresponds to what I see as well. Almost every organization is implementing ZTNA from a policy perspective, fairly broad access. Um, they have not gotten down to the level of individual application control where individual application control does commonly come up is it's not for the employee use case. It's for the contractor or partner use case. So I have a partner and I want to give them access to my SAP environment. That is often where you're, you will take the time and define what SAP means within your environment. Um, but for employees, we have thousands of applications. There is still a little bit work to be done to make defining applications at a really, really fine-grained level easy for organizations to do, because that is typically a fairly big lift. But if you have particular use cases like contract or a partner, that is where the lift is, is typically worth it, and you don't have a ton of applications that you are typically granting partners or contractors access to. So two types of zero trust access, and from this here on out, I won't be using the terms ZTNA or, or zero trust application access, I'll be using the term that we typically use internally and as well as from a marketing perspective, which is zero trust access. So two different types of zero trust access. You have clientless and client-based. Clientless is typically lightweight in some way, shape, or form. Web browser is the predominant, predominant method for accessing a clientless zero trust access solution. Protocol support is typically somewhat limited. HTTP, HTTPS is very common. You'll also see SSH, RDP, and maybe a few others. But in general, any clientless solution, even if there's a small software component, will typically only support a couple of protocols. This is typically best suited for partners, contractors, BYOD type use cases, where, and where the user accessing the application doesn't need a ton of applications, doesn't need some, kind of some of those old legacy application type access, you'll typically use this for, for those types of use cases. Internally within Cisco, we've used a lot of, published a lot of our internal applications via clientless zero trust access with the Duo Network Gateway, which we're not gonna cover here today. So you can do it for employees, but the reality is most organizations when they implement zero trust access are implementing client-based zero trust access for their employees. 
The advantage of client-based zero trust access is it is much more feature rich, supports pretty much any application that you have within your organization, which is why you typically see it used for employees and you typically end up using it um, because it supports all of the different types of applications employees might access. You can also sometimes end up using it for contractors, things like manufacturing, where the application is not HTTP, not HTTPS, it's kind of a proprietary application. So with that, let's go ahead and pivot into secure, the Cisco Secure Firewall Zero Trust Access. So as we go through this session, we'll build out this chart. And so what we're gonna talk right now is around the Secure Firewall capability that we've added in Secure Firewall 7.4. And so this gives you the ability to enable zero trust access for HTTPS applications. It runs on the secure firewall you probably have today, whether or not it's a physical appliance or a virtual appliance. It's primarily designed for applications that are client to server in their application flows. Um, and it uses TLS from a transport perspective. From a security perspective, you can apply TLS, decrypt, IPS, and anti-malware protection from a, from a inspection perspective. So what does this actually look like? So it is uses from an authentication perspective, SAML. So you can kind of think of this as the firewall gives you the foundation to give to, for connectivity, and then all of the policy control is inside the identity provider. That identity provider can be anything that supports SAML. So it can be Okta, it can be Azure Active Directory, it can be Duo as well. The advantage is, is it's super high speed. So we're using the firewall construct, we're not using a reverse proxy, although from a deployment perspective, it looks very similar in terms of how you would deploy a reverse proxy. But it gives you the speed benefits of a firewall doing TLS decrypt without the overhead of doing a full-blown reverse proxy. In terms of software requirements, you need to be running Snort 3, you need to be running Secure Firewall 7.4 or 7.4.1, and you need to be running in routed mode. It's not supported in transparent mode on secure firewall. So we're gonna do a quick demo. This is a very basic environment that I set up that with secure firewall zero trust access. I have a user browser um, that is pointed to an external DNS server. That DNS server has a couple DNS records. The DNS record for the firewall itself as well as a DNS record for the actual application. Both of those point to the external interface on Secure Firewall. Secure Firewall also has a, can, has a port open so that the user can reach to the IDP, which in this case is Azure Active Directory, Federations, Active Directory Federation Services. And then on the inside, I have an application server and I have internal DNS. Now, just as a reference point, I have the configuration that was used for a lot of the demos actually inside the reference slide. I'm not gonna cover them in detail, but if you actually wanna look at how things were configured, you can actually look at the hidden slides and they'll be in there. So what does the user experience look like with this? So I have a user, they want to access an application. They go ahead, launch their web browser, enter in the fully qualified domain name, same one that they use internally, in this case, billing.metronic.io. They go ahead, enter in their username, enter in their password. This is all within the SAML IDP. And then the firewall grants them access, assuming they pass authentication. Now, in that case, I was just using username and password authentication with Azure or Active Directory Federation Services. Obviously, you would probably want to apply multi-factor authentication, probably do use Duo to check the device posture, but as a, as a proof point, I wanted to use the simplest IDP that I could find. So user experience, super simple. You know, from, from a user perspective, they're not gonna know that they're actually accessing this through Secure Firewall. So what does it look like from an engineering perspective underneath the hood? So here is the basic flow that the client ends up going through. So I have my zero trust access device. It's running just a web browser. And DNS points to Secure Firewall. Um, so it, it does a DNS lookup. It looks up, in this case, the host csdac.mailab. That points to the firewall, and so it goes ahead and makes a connection to the secure firewall. Secure firewall gets that HTTPS request and says, hey, I need you to authenticate, so it redirects the user to the IDP. In this case, the IDP is Duo. 
between the user's web browser and the IDP, a couple exchanges back and forth to do the actual authentication, do multi-factor authentication, do posture checking with if the IDP supports it, and assuming the user passes um, all of that, they can then get a, a, a um, SAML authentication um, response, which they send to secure firewall, and then that gets them access to the actual application. Super simple. A couple things to call out about this flow if you actually go and implement it. If you have a failed authentication, so for example, the user tries to connect, it gets redirected to the IDP, and the user fails authentication. If you go to Secure Firewall, you're not going to see anything. The reason being is we did the redirect to the IDP, the user might have had a bad username, password, they might have not been authorized to access that particular application inside the IDP. And so if you go to the IDP, you'll see the failed session. But the secure firewall, it doesn't know that uh, what happened. It doesn't know that authentication failed or authorization failed. And so if, when you go set this up, if you're not getting access, you probably want to start your troubleshooting on the IDP. It's only once you start ending up on the firewall that you can actually troubleshoot there. One of the other common questions I get is, does this support posture in the firewall itself, or does, the, does this support host scan? The answer is no. From a posture perspective, we're depending upon the IDP to provide the posture. So Duo has a fantastic set of posture capabilities in terms of validating the endpoint, whether or not it's a trusted endpoint, whether you know, from an MDM management perspective, or Active Directory join, whether or not the device has a firewall running, et cetera. So use the IDP's capabilities from a posture perspective to do posture in this type of deployment. Flow is very similar in that type scenario. User connects to the firewall, redirects to the IDP, Exchange back and forth, authentication, multi-factor authentication, as well as posture. And then at that point, assuming that they pass, then they can go ahead and access the application. Similar from a flow perspective, if they fail posture, the place that you want to go check is not the firewall. The firewall doesn't really know what happened in the authentication flow. They just know that it just knows that it never got a cookie to say, yes, they can access the application. So if that happens, you'll want to go to the IDP. In this case, the IDP is Duo. That's where you want to check for the posture log and determine, hey, why was this device not allowed access? Now, assuming that the user goes ahead and they connect, they authenticate, we do apply continuous inspection to that traffic. So if the user is accessing a protected application, and they try to attack that application. Let's say the, dev the device they're on is compromised, or they try to upload malware. We will go ahead and apply the full Snort IPS signature set that you have configured to that traffic. So if you want to apply balanced security and connectivity, um, uh, security over connectivity, or a custom policy, you can apply that to the traffic as it goes through secure firewall. You can also apply malware policies just like you could to any other traffic that passes through secure firewall. And in this case, the, malware, the, the particular attack was dropped, and so the application only sees clean traffic. Now, if you do see traffic drop, for example, for security inspection purposes, that is a type of, of information that will be logged on secure firewall because it is the one that's actually doing that. So those are the types of drop traffic scenarios that you would see logged within Secure Firewall. Now, if you go to configure this, one of the options you will get is the ability to configure an application as an individual application or as a grouped application. And that determines when and how the session is sent to the IDP for authentication. So in this example, I have a set of applications that are configured as a group of applications and then I also have an application that's configured as an individual application. Now, each individual application that you configure or each set of groups of, of applications are configured as a separate application inside the IDP. They can also point to different IDPs. So in this example, I have <clears throat> the group configured to go to Azure from an IDP perspective, and I have that individual application configured to go to Duo. 
This is how we end up being able to control whether or not a user is allowed to access an application. The IDP sees them as different applications configured inside the IDP, and the IDP is what's controlling whether or not you're allowed to access that particular application or not. Now, from a flow perspective, every individual application, if the user hasn't already been authorized by the IDP, will be sent to the IDP to do that authorization and authentication. With grouped applications, it's a little bit different. So if a user goes ahead and they try to access the first application within a group, they will get redirected to the IDP, and they'll get access assuming that they pass IDP authentication. When they go to access the second application configured within that group, or the third or fourth, depending on how big your group is, when they try to access another one within that group, the firewall will see that, hey, you have a, already have a cookie for this particular group, and it will not send the user to the IDP for authorization or authentication. They will, SSO will be performed locally on the firewall, and they'll be able to go ahead and access the application. When you would, you would want to do this, for example, if you have an application that has multiple fully qual qualified domain names that need to be accessed more or less simultaneously, Let's say, for example, you have a directory server um, that you want to expose to, to the internet. Um, you have a set of, an image server that it needs to pool resources from, et cetera. You would likely configure that as a gr group of applications so that when the user goes and authenticates to, for the directory server access, they go ahead, do that authentication, and then when they go to access that directory server, they can also access the image server to pull the photos of all of the users in the directory. So that is a common scenario where you'd want to configure a grouped application with multiple fully qual qualified domain names associated with it. So a couple things to call out about this. So from an authentication perspective, we support SAML, we don't support OIDC, but you do need a SAML um, IDP in order to stand this up. OIDC, LDAP, RADIUS, none of those are supported authentication protocols for the purposes of this deployment. From a DNS perspective, you need to point the application's fully qualified domain name from a DNS perspective to the firewall. You can use this for both external as well as internal use cases. As typically, if you probably have a, uh, a split DNS, that's probably how you're going to end up needing in order to set this up. Um, it is supported in routed mode, um, cluster mode, multi-instance deployments, um, and it is actually one of the few features that you cannot run in evaluation mode. So I've personally in the past used evaluation mode devices in my lab. If you try to go do that, spin up a device in your lab on a VM, for example, in evaluation mode, you won't be able to configure this. It does need to be a license box. Um, the other thing to call out, the application control policy within the firewall does not apply. The zero trust access policy supersedes, so if you grant access to an application inside the zero trust access policy, that is the security policy that's going to be applied. It's not going to be the access control policy that will be actually applied to the traffic. A couple other things to call out from an application support perspective. HTTPS applications are supported, HTTP, RDP, SSH are not. Because it requires interactive SAML authentication, the application, even if it uses HTTPS, but it's not an interactive app application from a user perspective, it's not going to work. We're not gonna be able to send the user to the IDP, they're not gonna be able to authenticate, and we're not gonna be able to set the cookie. Other thing to call out, it's not a reverse proxy. It is a effectively TLS decrypt in line with cookie checking. We'll actually go through the flow here in a second. Um, it will not work for non-HTTP traffic that goes over port 443. So if it's a TLS session, but it doesn't use HTTP, that won't work. The reason being is we're setting an HTTP cookie. If we don't see that HTTP cookie, access isn't allowed, and so you'll just get continually redirected for authentication. And finally, the pre-authentication URL. You need a certificate that matches whatever the um, application is the user is accessing. So typically in my environments, I use a wildcard certificate. So 
for the firewall. So for example, if a user needs to access app1.example.com, app2.example.com, I'll have a wildcard certificate on the firewall for star.example.com. Makes it pretty easy from a configuration perspective. You can also do a multi-SAN certificate if you want. Now, if you had really good vision, you might have noticed that there was a, when we, after we did the authentication, there was a high port added to the end of the fully qualified domain name. We are going to explain why that is now. So after a user has gone through their authentication, they've gone to the same old IDP, they have, the, they, they have their authentication token, what's going to happen is they're going to do a post to the firewall saying, hey, I have my SAML assertion, here is the, the IDP has authorized me, here you go, Mr. Firewall, now what? The firewall is going to say, hey, I validated that particular SAML assertion, you're good to go. I'm going to return a cookie to you saying, hey, okay, you can go ahead and access this particular application. That cookie is going to be sent in all future requests. Now when the device, from a browser perspective, sends a request to say, hey, I want to ex access app.example.com, what's going to happen on the firewall is the firewall is going to say, I'm going to redirect you to a high port. Now this high port is going to be fairly consistent, but it is automatically determined um, within the firewall. You don't control which specific high port the user gets directed to. You can control the range, though. When they go ahead and then access that particular high port, what's happening underneath the hood is the firewall is creating a NAT translation. As mentioned previously, we're not acting as a reverse proxy. We're using firewall functions to actually do this. So inside the firewall, the firewall is going to create a NAT mapping. They're from the external IP address, and that high port will be mapped to the actual server IP address, and typically port 443. Underneath the hood, then, the, user, the, device is gonna, the user's device is going to make an HTTPS connection to the firewall. That's going to be forwarded on to the actual server on the back end, and you're going to have an end-to-end -end TLS flow which is being TLS decrypted by the firewall. The firewall has the certificate for the particular application server, and so it's able to see inside that particular TLS flow. Then when the user sends that cookie in their first HTTP request, we're going to validate that you have a cookie and that you can go ahead and access the application. If you have the cookie, then you're good to go. The other thing I should also add, from a NAT perspective, we don't actually open this to the entire world, that NAT is only open for the, the IP address that the user has come to, come from. So it's a very narrow NAT opening that actually ends, ends up being opened, and then we enforce fine-grained impersonation control with the cookie. Assuming the cookie passes, then we can go ahead and allow the application flow between the user's device and the application server. The advantage of this is, again, we're not acting as a reverse proxy. We're using the firewall functionality to actually really, from a really performant perspective, send the traffic from the client to the actual application server. So you end up with firewall-like performance with, you know, as if you were just doing standard TLS decrypt, but you can vary from a very fine-grained level control what users can access what applications. And then obviously applying all of the security inspection to the traffic, which you can configure up here. Any questions on secure firewall before I jump into secure access? Sure. When you said that the DNS has to be pushed to the firewall, can you use an external provider like Cloudflare? So the, the question was, um, you, do you, when you configure DNS to point to the firewall, um, can you use an external provider like Cloudflare? So let me clarify that statement. The DNS record needs to point to the firewall. The DNS, the name server record, doesn't need to point to the firewall. So we have had, like, with the Duo Network Gateway, there were scenarios where you actually had to delegate a subzone to Duo Network Gateway particular function, for a particular functionality. You don't need to do that with this particular solution. You can use any DNS provider that you want externally, but the DNS record for whatever application you're sending users to needs to point to the IP address of the secure firewall so that 
You know, when the user does the DNS, or when the user's device does the DNS lookup, it points that IP address, that FQDN, to the IP address of the secure firewall, and then that way the secure firewall is in the flow of traffic. Any other questions? There is not a chance I'm going to be able to hear that question. <laughs> So the question is, what happens to the NAT statement if the user is roaming? Thank you for screaming that out. So if the user roams from a different, from one IP address to another, the, their particular high port access would not be allowed. What would end up happening is when they would go access app.example.com, we would have the cookie set. So they go hit app.example.com, we already have the cookie set, the firewall is going to receive that cookie. It's going to say, hey, okay, this cookie is valid. And then it's going to go ahead and reprogram the NAT statement to allow the user to access that particular application's high port from their new IP address. One more question. So the question is, what kind of protections are there for man-in-the-middle attacks between the client and the firewall? So it's a TLS, TLS session. So if you have a valid TLS cert, that's a, it's same as applies to standard TLS. So the, the TLS certificate is validating that you're talking to a valid entity. Now, if you have like a bad root, for example, that's not going to, you know, you have a bad root on your device. Um, or a, a certificate authority has been compromised. I mean, that's the standard TLS um, complications. But it's effectively standard TLS security from a man-in-the-middle attack prevention. Okay, on to Cisco Secure Access. How many of you guys attended a Cisco Secure Access session this week? Okay, about 50%. So I will give a little bit of a high-level overview of Cisco Secure Access. So Cisco Secure Access has a number of different zero trust access capabilities within it. We have clientless zero trust access, which enables app access to applications such as HTTP or HTTPS. We have a brand new zero trust access module, which is going to be the focus of the rest of the session, which is built into Cisco Secure Client, client formerly AnyConnect. And we're going to talk a lot about that throughout the session. And then the other piece I want to call out is that with Cisco Secure Access, you can also apply a lot of zero trust access type controls with just standard VPN without actually having to deploy the zero trust access module. Um, the same type of user and group control we're going to talk about, you can apply to the VPN module. So we're going to dive into this here. Let's go. So for those that did not see a Cisco Secure Access session this week, Cisco Secure Access is our new cloud-based SSE solution that we released and announced back at Cisco Live US. So it delivers all the standard type functionality that you would expect from an industry perspective when it comes to um, security service edge. We have secure web gateway for cloud proxy, um, CASB and DLP for preventing exfiltration of data. Zero Trust Access, which we're going to spend a lot of time talking about. Firewall as a Service and IPS for protecting branch locations as well as inspecting the traffic as it goes across the network. We also add a ton of other functionality that's not available in kind of industry standard SSE solutions. So we have DNS security based upon all of our umbrella intellectual property. Multi-mode DLP for both API access to apply DLP as well as in-band proxy control of DLP. Advanced malware protection, which came from the SourceFire acquisition many, many years ago. Sandboxing in the form of threat grid, secure malware analytics, our Talos Threat Intelligence, you know, which is the largest non-governmental threat research organization. VPN as a service, so if you're using Secure Client today or any connect from a VPN perspective, you can point those users to Cisco Secure Access and they get a very similar user experience from a VPN perspective. Um, digital experience monitoring based upon thousand eyes, so the ability to monitor what a user's experience is looking at like and it'll help troubleshoot when there are performance issues. And then remote browser isolation to 
if, you are, if a user is accessing a site that you want to give them access to, but you want to not actually allow that code to execute on the endpoint, be able to run that HTML code in a remote, in a remote session, but then still allow the user to view the web page. So we're not going to spend a lot of time talking about Cisco Secure Access as a whole. We're going to specifically focus on the zero trust access capability within Cisco Secure Access. So I mentioned user experience. So a huge focus of what we built within Cisco Secure Access was all around how do we make a really transparent user experience for the user when they go and access applications. And the best way to illustrate that is by showing a demo. So this particular demo is going to be a user accessing Cisco um, applications behind Cisco Secure Access using the client-based zero trust access capability. So I have a user that's gone ahead and just started their day. They've booted up their PC, and they're going to go ahead and log in. In this case, they're logging in passwordlessly, not necessarily a requirement to use the solution. So they're going to go ahead and log in, and the minute that their PC boots up, they need to get to work. So they're going to go ahead and access a file share, in this case, it's some HR files, and they're just going to go ahead and launch it. Now these files are inside the data center, and you'll notice the user hasn't had to launch any kind of VPN, they haven't had to authenticate to a VPN, anything like that. That connectivity has all been stood up for them. They then they go and pivot and they want to access a web application. Go ahead, they just double click the shortcut on their desktop, and they're good, they're in. Again, this particular application is inside their, the organization network, it's not exposed to the internet. Then they want to access an application, in this case, that uses SAML for authentication. They'll just go ahead and use passwordless authentication with Duo, and they can go ahead and access the application. The key thing here, all of those applications, they're not exposed to the internet. The user doesn't really know where they are actually located, but they've been able to just open their PC and get to work much like they were in the office. So let's talk about how we've actually enabled that user experience securely. So all of that was put together through a new module called the Zero Trust Access module within Secure Client. Secure Client being the 5.x branding name that we used for AnyConnect. It is a brand new module. You don't have to run VPN. You don't need to run any other modules if you want to use the Zero Trust Access module. You, it's compatible with the other modules, but it can, it can run separately. It's not dependent upon any of the other modules. It delivers that transparent user experience. All of that traffic is forward proxied using a, a protocol called Mask, which we're going to double click into here in the next couple of slides. Uses a service managed um, client certificate, so you don't actually have to manage the PKI. And those certificates are protected by TPM to be able to prevent those certificates from being extracted and move to another device. It supports all, pretty much all TCP and UDP applications. So Mask is a protocol, which is what we use underneath the hood, allows you to tunnel arbitrary TCP or UDP um, data payloads inside that, that Mask connection and then proxy it to an uh, identity-aware proxy. One of the really cool things is this particular solution is compatible with third-party VPNs. We'll actually do a demo of that here in a little bit. And the whole, what actually underpins all of this is a couple next generation protocols, Mask and Quick, as well as TLS. So one of the questions that typically comes up is, well, why did you call it zero trust access rather than zero trust network access? And if one of the, in one of the demos, if you actually pay really close attention, you'll actually see it's an older demo. We actually did at one point have it labeled ZTNA. When we looked at what a lot of the ZTNA solutions in the market, we came to the realization that what we, we were doing was different enough that we didn't really want to attach the ZTNA name, ZTNA name to the solution. So it does a lot of things that a lot of ZTNA products end up delivering. So su support for things such as multi-factor authentication, the ability to do device posture checks, the ability to do micro-segmentation from a policy perspective. But if you dig in underneath the hood, a lot of the ZTNA solutions in the market, um, they are 
ostensibly using VPN protocols. They're using IPsec, DTLS, TLS. Um, they may sometimes be just really kind of rebranded VPN, so the user is still getting an IP address on the network. Um, it's kind of like VPN plus easier identity aware firewalling is actually kind of how the solution has been stitched together. Um, they don't have native OS support, so we'll talk about our native OS support on Samsung Knox as well as iOS. Um, their connectivity methods were limited, and then the credentials that are actually used um, are stored in software, and we'll talk about some of the risks associated with that. So from an from a industry perspective and from a marketing perspective, we made the decision to brand the module as Zero Trust Access, partially because of the things that I talked about at the beginning of the session, you know, you can implement both ZTNA and Zero Trust application outcomes with it, but also because if you look at kind of what is implemented underneath the hood, it's significantly different than pretty much every ZTNA solution that is out there on the market from a technical implementation. So let's talk about some of the basics that, you, that are enabled with this. So we use SAML authentication for zero trust access. So when, in, when a user goes ahead and in, um, installs the zero trust access module, they need to go ahead and go through an enrollment to be able to authenticate and get that certificate that we use for all future authentications. We use SAML to do that. Any SAML IDP that you want to configure, you can do that. So for example, you can use Okta, you can use Azure, we have lots of labs that you use both of those. We also have lots of labs and customers that are using Duo. So use whatever Duo or whatever IDP that you want that supports SAML. Other basic blocking and tackling. You can define policy based upon Active Directory or identity provider users and groups. So you can, if you want to, define very fine-grained access. The finance group can access the finance servers. The, um, the sales group can access the sales servers or particular sales servers. And you can be very either macro in terms of how you that define that policy. So you can say, if you're an employee, you can access everything inside the network. That would be something that you absolutely could configure. On the flip side, you can say, these two developers can access this particular JIRA server. So the policy can very, be very macro from a configuration perspective or very micro, depending upon how you want to do it. The advantage here is you don't have to configure DAP with secure firewall. You don't have to configure ICE policies. It's all built in within Cisco Secure Access. You can define, poli you can define resources flexibly. So you don't, are no longer limited to defining applications based upon IP address. We support IP address, so if you want to define an application based upon IP address or subnet, you can do that. You can also define it based upon ports um, and protocols. But you can also define applications based upon fully qualified domain name. And it doesn't matter whether or not that FQDN resolves to one IP address or 1,000 or 2,000. One of the really cool things is this is native FQDN support. And so we're not mapping that FQDN to IP addresses for enforcement. We're actually doing it based upon the true FQDN. So it makes it, you don't have to worry about how many FQDNs does that particular, um, FQ, uh, how many IP addresses does that FQDN resolve to. We can handle it with this particular solution. You can also do wildcards. So if you want to say star.dev.metronic.io or star.metronic.io, so open up a very large range of FQDNs, you can do that from a policy definition perspective. These same rules that you define from an application perspective also control the traffic that is captured by the zero trust access module. So you don't have to separately configure what is functionally split tunneling. If you configure an application, an IP address, an FQDN, we automatically add them to what we call the steering rules within the zero trust access module and that traffic will be steered to Cisco Secure Access automatically. So you define the application, we create the, the steering rules, push them down to the client for you, and then that traffic will be sent to Cisco Secure Access for enforcement. We also support posture. Now this is not host scan. This is actually underneath the hood, the same posture capabilities that Duo implemented. 
Now, you don't need to buy Duo. It's built into the product as a platform feature. But if you're, if you're familiar with the posture capabilities within Duo, very similar within Cisco Secure Access. You can check things such as operating system. Is a firewall enabled? Is the device encrypted? Is a system password set? And is it running anti-malware solutions? All of that can be checked. And you can also define those rules on a, or define that policy either globally or you can define it on a pool rule basis. So you can say, if you want to access the intranet portal, I don't care. You don't need posture. I'm not terribly worried about it. But if you want to access the financial transfer system, you better be coming from a device that is Windows, it's up to date, it has, it, it's encrypted, it has a system password set, and it's running um, uh, Cisco AMP for endpoints or secure, or secure endpoint. And then you can also apply security inspection. Again, you can apply security inspection either globally or on a per, per rule basis. So you can apply TLS decrypt for internal resources, and you can also apply IPS inspection for internal resources. You can give individual rules either the same policy globally, or you can define individual IPS policies on a per rule basis. So if you have an ultra sensitive server or a server that has some compatibility issues, so let's say it doesn't really do, for example, FTP in a RFC compliant way, you can throttle down the, the IPS inspection, or if you have a super sensitive server, you can throttle up the IPS inspection. Same underneath the hood, we're using Snort 3, we're using the same Snort signatures that, you use on, that are used on Secure Firewall. So if you're familiar, familiar with the IPS capabilities within Secure Firewall, those are the same types of IPS capabilities that are available within Cisco Secure Access. High-level traffic flow in terms of how traffic flows within Cisco Secure Access. So I have a device that's running a client or I have a zero trust access enabled OS. And in this case, the user's in London. That user will connect to their closest location from a zero trust access perspective. In this case, we have a, a data center inside the UK. And then within the Cisco Secure Access Cloud, we will then in, perform inspection on the traffic, validate that the user can access that particular application, and then we will forward that traffic on to the closest data center to where we have a peering point that you've set up um, to those applications. And we can peer either via IPsec connections. So in, let's say, the New York to US data centers, you have an IPsec tunnel set up. We can use that for backhaul in order to be able to get access to private applications. And then we also have something that's called a resource connector, which is effectively a um, VM that allows you to make a very easy connection to Cisco Secure Access, grant access to private applications, but you don't have to worry about routing, setting up IPsec tunnels, et cetera. But all of that traffic is moved from the UK to the closest location that, the, that the, the peering connection is in, and then you can go ahead and access your applications. What this means is that user in the UK was able to connect to their closest location. We split that traffic off and sending the traffic that's going to New York directly to the US, the traffic that's going to Australia directly to Australia, and so you're not having kind of complicated U-turns in, in less than ideal routing from a traffic perspective. That's one of the advantages of Cisco Secure Access as a SaaS platform is you get optimized routing based upon from where the user is, they connect to our POP, and then we then send the traffic to the next closest POP to the application. So I mentioned previously that we use Quick and Mask underneath the hood. So what is Quick? So Quick sometimes is referred to Quick UDP Internet Connections. It's not technically an acronym, that was actually a backronym, um, but it's a UDP-based stream multiplexy protocol that is really designed around next generation internet access. Um, it was first used in Chrome in 2012, and it's also been used in other places since. So it's used for HTTP3, it's used for iCloud Private Relay, Microsoft uses it for SMB over Quick. There's also DNS over Quick, so it's been used in a number of different places. Um, it's really designed for the next generation 
of protocols designed for the internet and, and eliminate some of the issues that we have with TLS and TCP. Mask, and I'm only probably gonna say this twice, is multiplex application substrate over quick encryption. Now, before you ask the question, it does not need to be quick encryption. It's kind of a, a, a misleading, um, misleading name. It can be over quick encryption, or if quick is blocked, it can fall back to TLS. Usually that is like nine times out of 10, I get a question about, well, what if UDP 443 is blocked, or what if quick is blocked? That's fine, mask can fail over to TLS. So what it is, it is mask is technically a working group that was taking taking quick and being able to tunnel arbitrary packets or payloads over it. So be able to um, send arbitrary TCP or UDP or IP or ICMP payloads within, within quick over HTTP3 or HTTP2. And so what, quote, what, what quick allows us to do or what mask allows us to do is it allows us to support any application pretty much from a protocol perspective, TCP, UDP, over either HTTP, HTTP3 or HTTP2, and it allows us to pretty much at that point support both web and non-web protocols over either QUIC, UDP443, UDP or TCP443 in the form of TLS. So why did we choose QUIC as a protocol? So QUIC has a number of advantages. It was designed to really take advantage of some of the learnings we had with TCP and TLS. So number one, it, is ha it has less framing overhead. It, when you have a super high speed connection or when you have you know, a, a, a low latency connection, you probably won't see the benefits of the less framing overhead. When you do start to see the, less, the benefits of less framing overhead is when your connection is less than ideal. For example, when you're on a Wi-Fi connection or a, a Wi-Fi connection, for example, on a train or on an airplane. And we'll actually show a demo of that here in a little bit. One of the other advantages of QUIC is that it allows you to change IP addresses without renegotiation. So with things such as like IPsec, if I go from a 5G connection to a Wi-Fi connection, my IP address changes. I have to, re, I have to redo my IPsec association. That ends up creating a somewhat less than ideal user experience. Um, QUIC doesn't um, depend upon the previous packet for decrypting the next, next packet. So you end up not having to wait for partially delivered packets to do the, de the decrypt. This becomes advantageous for protocols such as streaming protocols or voice or things like that. It allows you to have a much more responsive type experience. It's not vulnerable to TCP meltdown. So one of the things about tunneling TCP inside TCP is you have two TCP sessions that are trying to react to drop packets, and so you can end up with less than ideal perf performance. UDP, quick being UDP, doesn't have that challenge. No head align blocking. So quick flow control is actually done based upon the individual streams within the quick session. So if, for example, one stream is being blocked from sending, the other stream is not not block. So you don't end up having one application having issues from a send receive perspective influencing any of the other streams within the quick connection. And then the other thing is that you quick allows us at some point in the future if we choose to implement it, the ability to use multiple paths. So you can actually have a quick connection, a single quick connection that actually goes across multiple different interfaces. So if you have a 5G, 5G and Wi-Fi connection, for a single quick connection, we can actually use both of those interfaces because we're not actually tied to the IP address from a uh, security association perspective. Why did we, okay, so the next question is typically, well, why did you choose mask? So mask gives us another couple set of really nice benefits. Number one is there are no, there's no direct resource access. So mask is a proxy. So the user does not have an IP address on the network. All of their traffic comes into the proxy, it's proxied, and then what is actually seen by the application server is the proxy server IP address. The user does not actually get an assigned IP address. They are, we're just taking the data streams from the actual client and forwarding it across the mask connection. 
It has broad application support. Like I mentioned, we can support TCP, UDP, and sometime here in the future, um, hopefully ICMP as well. That's currently going through the IATF process. Fall back to HTTP2 if HTTP3 is blocked. So if you're in a, on a network that blocks quick, no problem, we'll just fall back to TLS for transport. We have a lot of flexibility in terms of being how we stitch up the tunnels. Unlike most IPsec or TLS or DTLS VPN implementations, we're not limited to a single tunnel. So we can actually have multiple different, different connections from the device to different head ends and the like from a mask perspective. And the final, and we'll actually do a demo of this, is native OS support. So mask is an IATF standard, and it's been built into both Samsung Knox as well as iOS, as well as Mac OS. So to kind of double click on how this, what this actually looks like. So this is a comparison of what ZTNA connectivity looks like versus some other methods. So at the top, you have just a direct IP connection. So you have a client and you have a server. You have, when an when a application on the client wants to send a, some data to um, an application on a server, it'll go ahead and open up a data stream. The client will then package that inside a packet. And you'll have, for each individual data stream, you'll typically have a, a TCP or UDP connection for that data stream. So in that top example, I have two data streams, um, could be from the same application, could be different applications, and that ends up producing two different TCP or UDP connections on the network. For most VPN and ZTNA implementations, it looks very similar to that top, but, I've ins but you end up inserting a VPN or ZTNA head end, and you end up wrapping that application packet inside a tunnel packet. And from a connectivity perspective, the device still has an IP address on the network. Um, there's, it's still making an end-to-end -end connection between the client and the server. And all that's really happening at the head end is the head end is stripping off that outer IPsec, TLS, DTLS um, packet, and then forwarding on the inner packet to the server, you know, applying some access control as well. ZTA is significantly different. So with zero trust access within Cisco Secure Access, there's two different ways we can do that. Either clientlessly, which is, operates as a reverse proxy, and so for each individual data stream that gets opened by the client, we, there is a TCP, TCP connection from the client to the reverse proxy within Cisco Secure Access, and then the reverse proxy terminates that TCP connection and then creates a new TCP connection from the, from the proxy to the server and takes that data stream and forwards it on from the reverse proxy to the server. Zero trust access looks a little bit, client-based looks a little bit different. Each of those data streams can actually, multiple data streams can actually be bundled inside a single mass connection, either over UDP 443, which would be quick, or TCP 443, which would be TLS. The mass proxy then takes these data streams and then separates them out into separate TCP or UDP connections back to the backend server that was accessed. That's at a very high level the difference between when you have direct IP, VPN ZTNA, ZTA clientless, and then also client-based or OS native ZTA. Now, one of the misleading things, because I just couldn't fit it on this diagram, is that it's not limited to just one, one connection with um, client-based CTA. So let's say, for example, I have two processes on my endpoint. I have Chrome and I have RDP. With a typical VPN setup, all of those connections are going to be bundled in a single VPN tunnel. So all of that connectivity is gonna go through the VPN tunnel. They're gonna be individual um, TCP or UDP connections. I'm gonna get to the head end, and then I'm going to go ahead and fan those out to the particular servers that the client application was requesting. With zero trust access, for each, in, right now, the way it works is for each individual application gets its own mass connection to the proxy. And right now, those proxies can be in the same data center, but that's not a technical limitation. Those proxies could actually be in different data centers or different locations. Um, and so in this case, I have Chrome. It's opened two data streams. 
Those data streams are sent to the mask proxy, and then that mask proxy then splits it out into two different TCP or UDP connections and forwards it on to two different servers. The other thing to call out is that it's actually done at a process level. So if, for example, I had two instances of SAP.exe that are making network communications, each of those actually has a separate mass connection. It's not a tunnel because we're not actually, there's no IP address. We're just taking that data stream, putting it into mask, and then forwarding that data stream within the mass connection. So what you will see if you actually look at the packet were to look at a packet capture is if you have multiple different applications running on your endpoint, you actually, would actually end up seeing multiple different mass connections from the client to one or more different zero trust access mask proxies inside the cloud. Now, to kind of illustrate why mask is so much better from a performance perspective, as I was flying over here um, on the airplane, middle of, middle of the Atlantic, I saw a bunch of different users trying to connect to VPN. And needless to say, it was not going well for them. Um, they kept opening it, trying to connect. It was failing. They kind of close it for a little bit, then open it again, try to connect again. It would fail. The really, it was at that point that I realized, well, let's see what we can do with zero trust access. So this is an extremely slow, Airplane Wi-Fi connection, connectivity, as you guys, if you've ever been on an airplane or ever been on the train, trying to use VPN on any of those locations tends to be pretty miserable. So this is the speed test that I was getting when I was on the plane. As you can see, I was not able to really do much of anything. Um, even Google, which is heavily optimized, probably one of the most optimized sites in the world, um, was taking like 10 seconds to load. So what I have here is two side-by-side -side demos. You can see I recorded one at 108 in the morning, I think, and 102 in the morning. Um, and so what I'm going to do is when I hit the button, both of them are going to start playing. On the left side, you have me trying to establish a connection with Cisco Secure Client. And on the right, what's going to happen is I just opened a browser. The user doesn't have to do anything interactively to start the connection. It all happens on the back end. But on the right, what's going to happen is the client's going to go ahead and initiate the connection and then also download, download the web page. And what you're going to see is it, in the time it takes ZTA to establish the connection and download this really complex web page, it's like 20 megs of download. It has like 50 embedded resources. It's a very realistic, complex demo website. That, it will actually do all of that in the time it takes VPN to connect. So here we go. So I've just got, went ahead and started it. VPN is trying to establish the user has go ahead, went ahead and clicked um, that they want to hit web.tme labs. And in about five seconds here, the page starts to load. And then in about another 10 seconds, all of those embedded resources will be downloaded. You can see on the VPN, the VPN is still spinning, trying to connect. And by the end of it, the page is loaded, and VPN just started to connect. So that is, I think, the best demo that I've been able to come up with that illustrates why mask and the fact that we're just taking a single mask connection, we're actually taking the data streams from the actual application and streaming that to the proxy is so much better from a user experience than VPN. Any questions? Okay. So that OS native capability that OS native capability that I just demoed is available for within Cisco Secure Access on Apple iOS as well as Samsung Knox. It is not yet available for generic Android. It gives you that transparent user experience where the user doesn't need to start VPN. They just access the application that, applications that you've allowed the user to access. And one of the really cool things is it delivers that ultra low latency, ultra performance performant connectivity, and even in challenging connectivity environments like airplane, airplane Wi-Fi, um, train Wi-Fi, things like that, you end up with a very good experience. One of the cool things, at least on iOS, is that the interception is actually being done within the application uh, uh, itself. 
You don't have to rewrite the applications to support this. It's a native OS functionality. In the case of iOS, the system call that has actually been modified, that if, a, a, if you actually make a system call to reach out to a web server, the actual OS has been changed, that it, if it sees that it's in the proxy list, that system call is fundamentally changed underneath the hood on iOS platforms. It ends up preserving battery life. You don't have to have always on VPN. You don't have to wait for VPN to establish. You don't have that VPN overhead that you would have, but you can still grant users access to private applications. You don't have to take that application from inside your network, expose it to the internet to allow them to have a great user experience when they're on mobile devices, things like that. It's also iCloud Private Relay compatible in the case of iOS. So if you are an iCloud Private Relay user, this can actually go over iCloud Private Relay. It's very similar from an endpoint perspective to the other um, internet providers that iCloud Private, Private Relay use, such as Cloudflare. And again, the reason this is possible is because we built this solution on those new, new industry standards, Mask and Quick, which we can incorporate into these different operating systems. And again, it supports all applications. So it doesn't matter if you want to use RDP, if you want to use web, you can do that over this. You're not limited to just web protocols like I did in that demo. Now, in terms of traffic flow, you don't need iCloud Private Relay. If you don't have iCloud Private Relay, the flow is from the client directly to Cisco Secure Access. If you have iCloud Private Relay enabled, you'll go from the device to Apple um, Relay, then you'll go to Cisco Secure Access, and then you'll also then be ultimately forwarded on to the application. So he, let's do a quick demo of what this looks like on iOS if I'm accessing multiple different types of applications. So here's my, my demo device, it's iPad running iOS 17. The user accesses a thick application, and they want to access some file shares. In this case, I'm accessing some SMB file shares. I can also do it over NFS. So this is an example of a non-HTTP application. I can also RDP to a server, another example of a non-web-based application. It'll go ahead and connect, configure the remote PC, and I can go ahead and access it without any real difficulty. Again, I haven't had to start VPN. I'm authenticating transparently via the certificate that was installed after device enrollment, which I'll actually show a, de a demo of here shortly. I can access web applications. So if I've previously logged in, I'm good to go. If I want to access an application that requires, for example, SAML authentication, I can use, for example, Duo passwordless authentication to get a very seamless access into that application. And so at the end of the day, what this allows you to deliver to your users is you can give them that in-office type experience. You can do strong multi-factor authentication if you layer that on with like an IDP, like Duo, that supports passwordless. And so you end up delivering a great user experience. And then one of the things you'll notice is I have no VPN configured, but at an OS level, there's a set of, there's a proxy server configured underneath the hood. There's also a certificate that's been installed. And then you have the steering policy that actually controls what actually goes to the ZTA proxy, which is what you see here. And it's a native OS function. If you want to learn more about actually what Apple implemented, you can check out this particular um, session that they did during their WWDC and I learn a little bit more of actually what's actually being done underneath the hood. So I want to just call that out since it is a new set of functionality. This is where you can go ahead and learn, out, learn what it's, what's actually being done. One thing to call out, it is built into the OS for both iOS and Mac OS. In the case of iOS, we are using the native functionality for those devices. For both Mac OS and Windows, we are using Secure Client today. So if you take a look at this, they will call out that the capability exists from a native perspective on Mac OS within Cisco Secure Access. At least today, we are not using that. The reason being is our Secure Client has a little bit more functionality that was in, that, than what's enabled with the native client. And so on the mobile, you don't really have the option of running clients, um, also you know, significantly more CPU constrained, things like that. We went with the native approach on the mobile devices. In the case of Mac OS, which has significantly more CPU, significantly more battery, we went with the secure client approach. 
So one of the things I did and have not covered up until now is how a user gets onboarded. So once a, once a user decides that they want to use zero trust access, whether or not it's Cisco Secure Client, whether or not it's on Samsung Knox, whether or not it's on Apple iOS, they need to go through an enrollment. And the enrollment is really simple, and it looks the same for pretty much every platform. What they will need to do is they will need to go ahead and launch the zero trust access module or the zero trust app on their device. At that point, they'll go through a one-time enrollment, emphasis one time, to go ahead and configure zero trust access. On mobile devices, you need to go ahead and enable notifications, um, and I'll go ahead and allow that, give the permissions, and then log into the SAML IDP. And so this can be username, password, this can be MFA, this can be passwordless. You can check, is the device managed, for example, from a Duo perspective? Whatever the IDP supports, you can go ahead and do. Once the user completes the IDP authentication, what happens underneath the hood is we go ahead and install a certificate on the device. Um, and if the device supports it, um, we store it within TPM for strong protection of that private key. And then at that point, they, never, they don't need to come back to the application. They don't need to come back to the application to start the connection. This will live on pretty much forever um, as long as the device is, is compliant and is good to go. So this makes it very easy, one-time process, and that's the reason why everything is so transparent. So how does, how does you now jumping back to Cisco Secure Client, so how, how does this end up actually intercepting traffic? So if you look at VPN, and in a lot of cases, a lot of the ZTNA solutions on the network, in the, in the market, when they would intercept traffic, they would intercept traffic either at the routing table or at the packet intercept filter layer. With a zero trust access module, we are intercepting traffic at the socket intercept layer. That gives us the ability to, number one, see the calling application. It also gives us the ability to get access to the traffic before VPN and before, for example, some other solutions on the net, on, on, in the market. This also gives us the ability that we don't have to do do route table manipulation. Um, we can capture traffic by FQDN, by IP address. That's what helps give us the capability to do traffic steering based upon FQDN. The other cool thing is it gives us this compatibility, even though we didn't particularly test it or, or build it for this. It was a design goal, but we actually didn't uh, specifically design this, for example, to be compatible with open VPN. We didn't make changes to the client. But the minute that this thing shipped, and I'll show a demo of this in a second, the first thing I did was, let's see whether or not Zero Trust Access is compatible with OpenVPN. It was literally the first code drop that I got from development. It worked alongside OpenVPN. Engineering had not done anything to design, design it specifically to work alongside OpenVPN. It just did based upon, at least at a high level design perspective, because of how we're intercepting the traffic. So this is a demo of a user connected to Cisco's Zero Trust Access, and they're connected to a third-party VPN, in this case, OpenVPN. So on the right, I have an OpenVPN connection. It's a full tunnel. And on the left, I'm connected to Cisco Secure Access via Zero Trust Access. So on the right, I'm connected to an RDP session via, Open, uh, via OpenVPN. And on the left, I'm going to access an application that's made available via Zero Trust Access. So both applications are made available to me simultaneously. Um, the user hasn't had to connect, disconnect their open VPN to access the Zero Trust Access application. They can actually get access to both of those simultaneously. From a traffic routing perspective, what's happening is Zero Trust Access is intercepting that traffic, putting it into the mass connection. Now, the Zero Trust Access sits higher in the stack. That mass connection is then being forwarded across that open VPN tunnel. We, we're not skipping over that, that full tunnel VPN. We're just going through it, and then we can go ahead and egress as long as that open VPN allows access to Cisco Secure Access. If that open VPN connection were a split tunnel, then it would go directly out to the internet um, to Cisco Secure Access. But the really cool thing is, again, we didn't design it specifically for open VPN. We didn't do any specific coding to make this work. It just worked, happened to work out of the box. 
So other things to call out. The backend connect connectivity to applications. So we support both site-to-site -site tunnels as well as resource connectors. So site-to-site -site tunnels, um, pretty much any device that you want, you can create an IPsec connection from your router or firewall outbound to Cisco Secure Access. You don't need to open up firewall ports inbound. You don't need to expose it to the internet. This is an outbound IPsec connection to Cisco Secure Access. The other way that you can establish connectivity for applications is what we call resource connectors. Resource connectors are effectively a small, VP, uh, small VM that establishes a DTLS tunnel to Cisco Secure Access. One of the unique things about the resource connectors is number one, if traffic is steered to a resource connector, connector, DNS resolution is done on the resource connector itself. The other is that all traffic re egresses from the resource connector IP address. You don't have to configure um, any routing to make that work. It just uses the default DNS that's configured on that particular network. It uses whatever routing is already in place for a standard type endpoint device with the resource connector. So this is especially useful if you just kind of want to grant access to some applications and you don't want to have to worry about routing or, or the like. The other really cool thing is that it allows you to access applications with overlapping, um, overlapping IP addresses. So let's say, for example, you have um, developers, they've you know, two different development groups, they've spun up different AWS tenants, they've used the default VPC, and they ended up deploying applications on overlapping IP addresses. I know this has never happened before. Developers always coordinate their IP address usage. Um, so they come to you and say, these two groups come to you and say, hey, I have this server, Alpha 101 Win. It's on the IP address 172.31.0.101. I need to grant users access to it. Then the other development group says, hey, I also have a server on 172.31.0.101. I need users to access it. And you're sitting there like, great, guys, thank you. Um, the resource connector is your solution for this. So what ends up happening is you can define these within the application as fully qualified domain names. So I can define it as alpha101-win, which is in VPC alpha. I can have an, another fully qualified domain name, bravo101-win, and I can then grant access users to users via that fully qualified domain name, and they can access both of those resources simultaneously by fully qualified domain name. So I have a demo of this real fast, of, of accessing servers with overlapping IP addresses. So the user's gonna go ahead and launch RDP. They're gonna go ahead and log in, and you'll notice that they're accessing it by fully qualified domain name, in this case, alpha101-win.metronic.io. Other user wants to, the same user wants to also access bravo101-win, both of these are on the same exact IP address. We're intercepting the traffic based upon fully qualified domain name. Even though these two servers both have the same IP addresses, the user can interact, them, interact with them at the same time. It's not a problem. What's happening underneath the hood is we're intercepting that data stream from the client, um, mapping that to a synthetic IP address, which the user doesn't see. And based upon that synthetic IP address on the client, we're then able to forward the traffic to the appropriate resource connector. Now, in this particular example, both of these are on the same, within the same domain, Medtronic.io. That wouldn't be a requirement. You could actually have them on different domains. That would be perfectly valid as well. So things such as um, AWS, GCP type use cases, acquisitions, you don't have to worry about IP addressing if users are accessing resources by fully qualified domain name. So last piece, I've talked about TPM. I'm going to give you an example of why TPM is so important. How many people here use certificates for VPN authentication? Okay, you are going to want to pay attention to this, and you're probably going to have a little bit of homework here very shortly. So most VPN deployments, when you deploy certificates, will deploy the certificates with the key marked as non-exportable. Most of the time, these keys will end up being stored in a software cryptographic service provider within Windows. The problem with that 
is without TPM protection, that checkbox, you know, allow private to be key to be exported, unchecking that checkbox, or the, the associated private key is marked as non-exportable, is really kind of a user control. It's not really a security control. For years now, you have been a, had the ability to export quote unquote non-exportable private keys that are stored in software cryptographic service providers. There was a paper published in 2011 um, that talked about effectively reverse engineered how Windows obfuscated and stored that particular bit flag that controls whether or not a certificate is exportable or not. That was turned into a piece of code um, um, which was published out on GitHub in 2016, which I've been using at this point for you know, eight years. Other tools such as Mimikatz and Jailbreak I've also used in the past to export non-exportable keys. Those depend upon um, injection and hooking. The, the particular tool I'm gonna show here in a second doesn't, it actually just fully reverse engineered what Microsoft did to store those keys. So if I'm an attacker and I want to export a certificate that's been marked quote unquote as non-exportable, here is the example. Now, a couple things to call out about the demo environment. I deployed it as a brand new Active Directory Forest on Windows Server 2022. I accepted all of the defaults. I didn't do any tuning there. But if you were to deploy an Active Directory Server 2022, a new forest, these are the settings that you would get. I also deployed certificate services on Windows Server 2022, again, accepting all of the defaults. I deployed the certificates via Active Directory services and I, within the template, I configured it for allow private key to be exported. I disabled that option. The demo workstation I'm showing this on is a fully patched Windows 11 enterprise device. I have Microsoft Defender fully running with default protection, and the user is not running as an admin. They are running as a standard user. So I'm going to go ahead and use that tool I mentioned called Export RSA, or actually, not yet. Jumping back, I'm going to first show that the certificate is on the device and it's marked as non-exportable. So if I go into the user certificate store, go into certificates, and I go and try to export it, you'll see that the certificate is marked as non-exportable. Okay, in theory, the user shouldn't be able to export that. Not necessarily true. So, certificate is marked as non-exportable. They can export it, but they can't. So I'm going to go ahead and launch a script that uses that export RSA tool to go ahead and export the private key. Super simple, I'm just going to navigate to a folder where I want that certificate stored after it's exported, and all of these commands are in the next section if you want to do this yourself. I'm going to launch the export RSA tool, say yes, I want to export the public and private key for that cert user. I'm going to go ahead and enter a, a, the password that I want to use on the PFX file confirm that password for the PFX pile, and I've gone ahead and I've exported that certificate. And then I'm going to go ahead and dump it on the desktop. At this point, I have a perfectly valid PFX file on the desktop that contains both that user certificate and the private key. Now let's go ahead and verify that the particular private key is actually valid. So I'm going to go ahead and use OpenSSL. I'm going to run a couple commands to export the certificate, export the certificate public key, create a file called hello world, going to go encrypt that file with um, that public key. Then I'm going to go ahead and take that PFX file, get the private key out of it, and then go ahead and decrypt that text that I encrypted with the public key with that private key to prove, yes, I have the public key, I have the private key, and I can go ahead and I have a valid set of keys. Now, if I take that certificate, and I go back to the user, manage user certificates just to give kind of another visual evidence that, hey, I actually have the valid private key. I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to delete that certificate that was previously marked as non-exportable. I'm going to go into certificate management, delete that certificate, and then I'm going to go ahead and take that PFX file and I'm going to import it. I'm going to import it and actually say, hey, yes, you can go ahead and export the private key. And what you'll see, I have the same exact certificate I have the private key, and I can go ahead, this time when I actually go and try to export it, I can go ahead and actually export it, because I, 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 when I imported it, I marked it as exportable. 
This is the reason why, when we deployed zero trust access, that we use TPM protection for the private key. Even, you know, even though you know, quote unquote certificates are marked as non-exportable, the reality is as a user, I can export that certificate even though that it's been quote unquote marked as non-exportable. If keys are not stored inside a TPM, the reality is, is if you're able to compromise the OS, or in this case, you reverse engineer what the OS is doing, you can end up exporting the private key. And you'll see, I can now have the ability to export that private key. So if you want to do this yourself, these are all the commands that I used in the demo. You can try it out. This works really well for user certificates. If you want to export a computer certificate, there's only one slight change you have to make. You need to use PSExec and do an interactive session as system, and then you can also grab the computer certificates as well. That requires you, obviously, to have admin privileges, but you can also grab computer certificates that are marked non-exportable in the same way. So the way that we deal with this problem with zero trust access is we use the uh, trusted platform module um, or secure enclave to store that certificate private key. That allows us, even if the OS is completely compromised, TPM is effectively a small microprocessor, and you can program it to say, no matter what the OS tells you, you are not allowed to export the private key. Now, technically, if you're like a nation state and you're super, super sophisticated, you can take that chip and, and tear it apart and actually get the actual individual bits off the chip. So to help prevent against those kind of really kind of far out there attacks where you need physical access, we also are using ACME, or the Automated Certificate Management Environment, to manage those certificates. The certificates that we install on the device are not long-lived certificates. They are only valid for five weeks in total. After three weeks, we start trying to renew that certificate. So even if you were a nation state and were able to grab a certificate off of a TPM after you've you know, taken the TPM apart, things like that, and you've had physical access to the device, that certificate is only going to be valid for a very short period of time. So we've taken two steps to help protect that certificate with zero trust access, because it is such a critical component of the authentication flow. So with that, thank you very much. If you have any questions, I'll be up, I will be around for as long as you guys want. Ask the questions in WebEx if you want. And please, if you enjoyed this session, fill out the survey one last time for me. Thank you very much. Have a safe trip home, everyone.